He is risen. He is risen indeed. I wonder how many people in this room can think back a few years ago to September the 11th of a number of years ago. I think it was year 2001. How many of you were captivated by what you saw? All right. How many of you were anybody in the room actually in New York City at the time? All right, none of us were. Okay, just was curious. How many of you were in a school or you were at work and you were, everything stopped and, and everybody started watching television, right? Did you watch the event happen once and that was it? You probably watched it a hundred times, right? Over and over and over again. Something that had transpired that, that you never thought would ever happen. Something that would absolutely shake everything of the foundations of our own nation. It captivated people all over the globe. It was a phone call from upstairs in our, in our apartment in, in Moscow that we received from a man that we had, a uh, family that we had interacted with down on the playground just, just about two weeks earlier. And all Vasily could say was, Sean, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I, I tried to do his accent best I could, so you have to understand that was, that was pretty close. And I said, Vasily, what's the problem? He said, just turn on the television. And even there in Russia, everything was focused attention there in New York City. The television cameras began to show what was taking place, and we watched as the live, live as it happened as the second plane hit the Twin Towers. I was an eyewitness, and so were many of you. But there are people today that would probably doubt the experience ever happened because they didn't see it. They weren't privy to it. And so they would look at you as if to say, that's impossible. With the technology that we have today and with all of that happens there within our government, there is no way that there could be such a violent strike against our nation. Well, if that isn't something that would happen today, give it 10 years. Definitely give it 20 years. 50 years from now, people will begin to talk about how it never really happened, much as many people say today in regards to the Holocaust. And yet, Deanna's grandfather was one that liberated one of those camps. And the horrors that he saw were true. But there are people in our society today that would like to say that since you haven't seen it, it simply didn't happen. So how will you respond? How will you react 15, 20 years from now when someone says to you, the attack on the Twin Towers never happened? Will you be upset? Will you be angry? Will you be irritated? Will you argue with them? Will you say to them, I saw it, it therefore happened. And yet, men and women, young people and children, today we celebrate an even more amazing event that took place that has completely shattered everything that people once thought. It has reached down to the ground, to the ground level and it has shaken everything that people had believed. What those 2,000 years ago, a little beyond that, 3,000 as far back, 3,000 years back, what they believed the Messiah would be, Jesus would show that the Messiah had yet another mission first. And that was to bring redemption for all of mankind. And he would say during those 33 years as he walked on this planet, he would say, the Son of Man must be handed over. He must suffer, bleed, die and on the third day, rise again. Paul would write it this way. He would tell us that if the resurrection is a myth, then of all the people on the planet, you and I as Christians are to be pitied because we believed in a lie. My friends, this morning I want you to know the resurrection is not a myth. The tomb is empty. The grave has given up that one who once was there, who had laid his head down only for three short days. 
And when he came out, he rose victoriously as victor over the grave, over death, over hell itself. He is alive. He is risen. This morning, I want to invite you to walk with me, if you could, for just a few moments through that day, that resurrection morning, to understand, put yourself in that place, that I want you to understand there were more than just one or two individuals that saw the risen Jesus. And by the time we get to the end of our time together, my trust is that you will have seen Him risen and glorified today. It was early morning when the women went to the tomb. It's just after sunrise. They'd gone with a purpose. Their hearts were saddened. Their, their, their countenance was downcast. And yet they had a purpose. They had something they had to do. Within that group of four to eight women, there were various spices and the like that they were carrying. And they walked to the tomb. It was a long way for them that day. Not because it was a great distance, but because of the heaviness of their hearts and the task that was at hand. They had fellowshiped with Him. They had eaten with Him. They had experienced His healings in their lives. Their lives had been transformed, and yet they walked with a heavy heart to a tomb with one question in mind as they got there, who will roll the stone away for us? And as they carried those spices, they arrived that day to prepare the body of Jesus. But very soon they would discover that he's not dead, but he's alive. An angel would be the one to move that stone. It wouldn't be uh, anything uh, of, of great difficulty for him, for that, an that angel sent from the Lord would go and simply remove that stone to reveal that the tomb was empty. Awesome in his appearance, we understand. For at the moment when those women arrived, they would see an angel seated to the right of the tomb, there seated upon that boulder, that rock, that had once entombed the Lord Jesus Christ. And as they glanced at him, they saw that he was glorious in his appearance, uh, one that would strike fear in the heart of the strongest of men on the planet. Mark 16, 5 would tell us that he was very awesome as he came down from heaven, walked over to the stone, rolled it away, and sat down on it, waiting. Soldiers had been standing there. They had been watching. They had been uh, taking, taking care that no one would disturb the tomb. But the moment that that angel appeared, those soldiers went white like ghosts because they were scared to death. Can I tell you something? That if you saw one of God's holy warring angels, if you saw one of those mighty men, those mighty angelic beings standing in front of you, you too would probably have to change your shorts. <laughs> it's a reality. You would be scared to death because they are so awesome and glorious in their appearance. Why? Because they spend night and day, moment by moment, in the presence of Almighty God, worshiping Him forever and ever, ascribing glory and praise to Him. And there they were that day, that moment, he walked, he, he, he landed on the planet. I don't know if it was Gabriel. I don't know if it was Michael. I want to believe it was Michael, but I don't know. It was one of those angels. He got down on that, on that ground and he walked over and simply rolled the stone away and sat down as if to say, I've got something special to show you today. You came expecting to find the dead. Can I tell you something? He's not dead. He's alive. He's alive. He's alive, was the message that he would give. His announcement outside that tomb was, don't be afraid. Of course, don't be afraid. For those, those soldiers are already petrified in their fear. But he didn't want those women to be scared. He wanted those women to be encouraged, and yet they were confused. They didn't understand what was going on. They recognized the fact that something glorious was taking place. And in the midst of their sorrow mixed with joy, they found confusion. But that angel looked at them and said, would you just come on inside? I want you to see something. He's not here. He's alive, just like he said. Imagine if you would, you're one of those women, and you walk in, maybe, I don't know, maybe one of them dropped one of the, the cisterns, I don't know, but I, if it had been me, I might have dropped it just out of fear, but, but they walk into the tomb, 
And, and, and understand, the tomb was, was, was not like our, our modern mausoleums. You know, it wasn't one of those things that's nice and, pl- and, and, and set up just right and, and cl- uh, clean. But it was a dirt floor because it was a cave, folks. And, and in that cave, they had taken and someone, uh, Joseph of Arimathea, had, had built a, a, a place where the body of Jesus could be laid. And they walked into that place and they could smell the dirt and may have been able to catch the aroma of the dried blood that was in the room. And they looked around and went over to the place where he was laying and there was nobody there. And the word tells us that suddenly two angels appeared next to them. One on their right and one on their left. Now, if they weren't scared outside, now they're inside the tomb. I'm thinking they're wondering if somebody's going to close us in. But no, those those angels inside that tomb, their voice would be the testimony that would provide legality of the resurrection of Jesus. You see, in, in Jewish law, it's the testimony of two that would make something legal. And so those two present would be the legal representation that would declare to those women, he's not dead, he's alive. And he is waiting for you. He will appear to you. He's not here. Luke 24, verses 5 and 8 would tell us that. Their announcement, why do you look for the living among the dead? I love that phrase. Why do you look for the living among the dead? Was it not Jesus who had said outside of Lazarus' tomb, behold, I am the resurrection and the what? Life. He who believes in me shall not die. Isn't that incredible? Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee? The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. I find it absolutely just like God that at Christmas, a band of shepherds would sit out on a hillside And there, a lone angel would begin to sing this great message. And what was his greeting to those men that night? Fear not. For behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Folks, Easter comes because Christmas happened. And those angels celebrated the birth of Jesus. And they announced it to those shepherds that were there, those lowly men of that night. Is it not just like the Lord to send that messenger once more? Behold, fear not, for I bring you good tidings of great joy. For today, out of this tomb, rose one who is king. Behold the swaddling clothes he was once wrapped in. They are no longer around him, for he has been set free. He is alive forevermore. He's not dead. He's alive. Running from the tomb, the women would see him. I don't know if you ever caught that passage of Scripture, but but in Matthew 28, verses 8 to 10, it says that that the women rushed from the tomb after this news. They went, where were they headed? They were headed to the apostles, headed to see those, those, those 11 guys to let them know Jesus is not dead. He's alive. This is the message that they had heard. They were confused. They, they didn't understand all that was happening, but they began to run. They had great news, just like those shepherds back years earlier, 33 years earlier, had gone through the town declaring the Savior's been born, the Savior's been born, and now they're going to say the the Savior has conquered. The Savior has conquered. Afraid to believe, afraid not to believe, they ran from the tomb, filled with joy and hope of this news. And Jesus met them along the way. And he comforted them. Jesus' first words to those women, do not be afraid. But go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There. There they will see me. It says that when those women saw Jesus, that they fell at his feet and they began to grab a hold of it. In my mind, I have this picture. If, you ever, if you've ever dealt with kids and played with kids and interacted with kids, you've had this situation where, where you know, we're, we're having fun and they just love you and they might not be able to jump up into your arms, but they'll grab a hold of your leg. <laughs> Anybody had that? I have walked many a mile with a child wrapped around two legs. 
Uh, it's true. And, and, you know, it's great fun because you lift them and, you know, it's great exercise too. And you lift them and you move and, and they're having fun and all of that. But it, it wasn't quite like that. But I believe those women, when they saw Jesus, they get fell on their face before him. They grabbed a hold of his feet because they wanted to know it's real. I didn't just, they didn't just want to hear it. They didn't just want to see it. They wanted to touch and know it's real. He's here. They had seen him die. They had been faithful. They had been at the cross. They had been there near with one another as they were comforting one another. They had listened as Mary wept. They had watched as Jesus had died and the words that he had said from the cross. They were there the entire time. They were one of the ones that, that went with them and followed Joseph of Arimathea as they went to the tomb and laid Jesus to rest. And now he's alive and their hands have touched, their eyes have seen, they know, they know the truth. He is not dead. He's alive. After telling the disciples Mary Magdalene, from whom seven demons would be, have been cast out by Jesus, she would be alone in the garden. You see, when the, disciple, when, when the ladies went and they shared with the disciples, this is what happened. John and Peter went running back to the tomb. And if you read the Gospel of John, John's pretty quick about letting you know which one ran faster. John was the faster runner than Peter was. But when John got to the tomb, I don't know if he was just out of breath or if he was just being respectful. He wouldn't enter the tomb immediately, but Peter went running in. And it says that Peter went and he grabbed a hold of the grave cloths and saw that it was true. Mary Magdalene was with them. She went running along behind them. And when Peter and John left the tomb, there Mary was at the tomb. Confused, bewildered. What has all taken place? I don't understand. But there Mary would be and she would weep. Confused and weeping, angels would appear yet again and ask her, why are you crying? It's almost that, didn't you get the message a few minutes ago? We already said, why are you looking for the living among the dead? He's not here. He's alive. Why are you crying? The depth of her grief and the confusion had impacted her ability to believe that he was alive. Even as those angels, I, you know, I wonder, as she was looking at these angels that are speaking to her, Jesus appears behind her. I wonder if the angels, as they're talking, if they don't just get a little glint in their eye, and they just kind of smile and think, this is going to be fun. This is good. And all of a sudden, Mary hears a voice behind her say, woman, why are you crying? Wrapped up in her grief, she turns and believes that Jesus is a gardener. Well, he did plant a garden once upon a time. We called it the Garden of Eden. Okay, you had to walk back there with me. Okay. Okay. Um, <laughs> But she believed that he was a gardener, just did not recognize him. And says, sir, they've taken my Lord and I don't know where they put him. But if you'll tell me where he is, I'll go and I'll take care of the body. And then he said her name. Mary. A word that she had heard many times over. A word that was held with tenderness and compassion on his lips. Mary. Mary. You know, when our name is found in the mouth of someone who loves us and someone we love dearly, there's nothing more precious than the sound of our name spoken by that one. Maybe it's the voice of your mother or your father that you hear that is that, or it's the voice of your spouse, that one that's special to you. When they say your name, your heart flutters, there's warmth that is enveloping you, Oh, we've heard our name spoken in harsh ways. We've heard our, our name mentioned when there is a uh, discipline that takes place. Anytime I got all four of my names, I knew I was in trouble. Some of you don't realize my name is James Nathan Sean Towns. I just go by Sean. And whenever my mother said James Nathan Sean Towns, I knew I needed to run. Because it was spoken in a manner that let me, James Nathan Sean, I mean, I never knew my mom was a base, but she could be a base once upon a time. When I wasn't listening and there were discipline was about to take place, that's when I heard it. Do you know what? I hear my wife just call my name. Or I hear the words over the phone or face to face from my children, Daddy. 
there's something that just makes me go weak in the knees. When Jesus said Mary, that's all he had to say. Mary. She knew. She knew because of the tenderness by which that name had been mentioned. And her response was instant. Rabboni, which means teacher. And she realized. She walked away from those moments, ran to tell the disciples the news. He's not dead. He's alive. Peter, who had been following Jesus from a distance the night of all of the, of the betrayal and the night of, of all of the different illegal um, uh, trials that took place, would find himself in a situation where he would deny the Lord. In fact, Jesus had told him that night, Peter, before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me or disown me three times. And Peter said, surely not, Lord, I will die for you. No, Peter, you're going to deny me. And without, fate, without, without failing, it happened. Three times. Oh, you're a Galilean. No, I don't know the man. No, I don't know the man. Remember that Peter was a sailor. And so when it came down to the third time and it said that he called down curses on himself, you can just imagine what Peter said to say he didn't know Jesus. It says that Peter went out and wept bitterly when the rooster crowed because he had denied his Lord three times and gone back to that old life. We don't know that Peter was very near the cross when Jesus died because of his shame. Peter would keep himself a little distant from the rest of the apostles those following days. In fact, Jesus would tell, the message from the angels would, would actually be, go and tell the disciples and Peter that I'm going ahead of them and I will, and they will see me in Galilee. Why Galilee? Because that was where Peter was headed. Peter was leaving the ministry, leaving Jerusalem, going back to being a fisherman, and Jesus knew that, and he was going back to the place where he called him. Tell him I'm going to Galilee, and there I'll see him. We don't really know where this particular event took place, but two verses of Scripture tell us that the Lord saw Peter personally. And I believe that as he interacted with Peter that night, that day, that, uh, that, it was, that Christ would reveal to him that he was not rejected. I don't know have, if you've ever felt rejected but because of something you did that I, I just, I'm not worthy to be there. Can you imagine how Peter felt? And so Pete, the, the Word of God tells us that Jesus would appear to him there in Jerusalem before he had even gone to Galilee. Jesus met with Peter privately. And from that meeting, Peter went on to meet with the other disciples with the news. He's not dead. He's alive. That same day, two other followers of Jesus would find themselves on a road headed to Emmaus. Filled with grief, as all of them were, they would share the stories of the weekend, of what had transpired, the confusion that they were experiencing. And it says that all of a sudden, Jesus appeared and walked alongside of them, but he kept his appearance or his recognition from them. He didn't want them to know at first that it really was him. Sneaky guy, isn't he? Sometimes he just wants to help us process through there was a purpose and so Jesus begins to engage these two individuals as they're walking to Emmaus and as they're walking they're sharing the various things they said what are you some new person that's come to this area don't you know the events that have happened and Jesus said what events the events about Jesus of Nazareth and now let's get the picture here Jesus is the one they're talking to are you new to this area don't you know what happened of course he knew what happened But he wanted them to process it through, and so they began to share with Jesus. And then they say, as they get towards the end of their uh, conversation, they say to him, we had hoped that he was the Messiah, but now we don't know. It says that Jesus would begin from that point and open up the scriptures to them to prove that he is the Messiah. They were approaching, they got to Emmaus, and as the evening was approaching, Jesus pretended as if he was going to keep on walking. And one of them said, Cleopas is his name, or Cleopas was his name. And he said to Jesus, listen, why don't you stay with us and at least have supper tonight? And Jesus said, okay. And there, something transpired that they had seen over and over again. It says that there at the table that Jesus took bread, and he gave thanks, and he broke it. And he gave it to them. And then 
they realized who he was. Wasn't that significant? Wasn't that important for them? Because as Jesus had met them, their eyes would become open that he's alive. He'd met them in a way uh, that, that was so familiar and yet had new meaning. Catch this. The bread that had been broken and given to them was now recognized as the body that had been broken and given for them. And so it says with haste, seven miles away Emmaus was from Jerusalem. They had walked it. It had been a long time. But they ran back to Jerusalem this time. In haste, they ran back to Jerusalem with the news. He is not dead. He's alive. As they were gathered in that room, the, the ten of the disciples, or sorry, eleven disciples were now there, and, and these two followers of Jesus also in the room, and they're recounting the story, and, and it's in that room that the disciples said that, that the Lord has shown himself to Peter. It's all of this is true. And as they're having this conversation, and the two men are sharing their story, we were walking, we were talking, he showed up. This is what he said. Our hearts were burning with everything that he said. He proved from this passage as Isaiah and Jeremiah and all of these guys had said, in the midst of all of that, Jesus showed shows up in the room fulfillment of whenever two or three are gathered in my name there I am in the midst of them but Jesus shows up in the room and all of a sudden a holy hush if you will falls across that place as different ones look around and they see there he is now the other disciples are seeing with their very eyes and Jesus would say behold my hands look at my feet don't be afraid I'm not a ghost so look at this, touch me and see. Oh, you still don't believe me? How about give me a little bit of that broiled fish over there? It's pretty good, let me show you. And he ate. And it says that as he ate, they believed. As he showed them these things, they believed. They realized that he is not dead. He's alive. One week later, those men would be gathered together once more in that same home. Without question, they were talking about what had happened earlier because Thomas, who had not been present earlier, was now with them. Thomas would say, in essence, I want the same benefit you got. Unless I see his hands and I see the nail prints that are there and I see the wound in his side and I place my hand there, I will not believe. As that, I think, before the words were fully off of Thomas's lips, Jesus stands in front of them once more. And right in front of Thomas. Thomas, here are my hands. Put your finger here. Here's my side. See this wound? Put your hand right here. Stop doubting, Thomas, and believe. And Thomas's response in that moment was to fall to his knees, my Lord and my God. Faith had been met with the, the, the actuality of his presence there. And in declaration, my Lord and my God, Jesus would say, Blessed are those who have believed without seeing, Thomas. You believe because you have seen and you've touched. But how blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. That's you. That's me. The Lord in that moment was looking 2,000 years ahead and said, Blessed are you because you believed without ever seeing. Back in Galilee, sometime later, Jesus would appear to the disciples while fishing. Remember I said that Peter was pretty much done with ministry? Well, there he was. He told the guys, listen, I'm going fishing. And they go out there and they have a typical fisherman's night. At least what had been typical for those guys. Nothing. I mean, it's true. When Jesus first called the disciples out, remember that miracle that had happened, that there they were out in the sea and they were fishing all night long and Jesus calls out to them, how's the fishing going? And I think Peter kind of grumbling to himself at that point, that first time said, uh, not well, landlubber. And Jesus said, just throw the net on the other side, you'll catch fish. I, have, how many of you are fishermen in the room? Come on. Seven of you. Okay. Now, do you take advice from non-fishermen? Out loud. Is that a yes or a no? No, you don't, do you? I mean, if they're not out there casting their, casting their, their, their line, then they really don't have an opinion, right? I mean, who are you to tell me to do it a different way? You're not out here doing it. Peter and James, John, I'm Andrew, those guys were professional fishermen. 
And there was this guy on the shoreline, this teacher, this rabbi, because they called Jesus rabbi, kind of looked like a teacher, and he says, just throw the net on the other side of the boat, you'll catch fish. I mean, there were probably some words that were mumbled under their breath that you and I would never say in church. Let's be honest, they were real people like you and me. And yet, for some reason, they said, well, let's just humor him. And they tossed the nets over. And it says that the catch was so great that the nets were about to break. Fast forward three years. And there at the Sea of Galilee, the men had been out fishing all night long. And they were tired. And they were hot. And they were ready to do something other than fish. And Jesus calls out, how's the fishing going? Yeah, great, nothing tonight. Why don't you throw it over to the other side of the boat? And so hesitantly they did it. And yet again, the nets were so full that the, that the, the nets were going to break. And as they put the, the fish into the boat, the boats were about to sink. There were so many fish. You see, these men that had become fishers of men had forgotten the trade of fishing. And Jesus needed to remind them, let me show you where to cast the net. In that moment when the miracle happened, Peter said, it's the Lord. And he left all of his friends in the boat and let them deal with the fish, and he swam to shore. And there at the feet of Jesus, in conversation, he would be restored. Jesus had already fixed some fish for them. He's a great cook, evidently. Prepared it for them. See, from that shore, the disciples would leave everything, and they would follow him even though he would go on to heaven because they knew the reality he's not dead he's alive 40 days had passed since the resurrection scripture tells us that what we read in the gospel accounts of the various resurrections are just a small glimpse of all the things Jesus did during the 40 days between resurrection and his ascension that there were many things. It says that he did a variety of miracles and the like in, in order to help them be solidified in their faith and to understand that he's not dead, but he's alive. There in Jerusalem, Paul would write about it this way. It's in Luke 24, 44 to 53, and also in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 6. There in Jerusalem, more than 500 people. All right? We've got about 150 people in the room today. All right? So if you, don't, if you couldn't take the testimony of the women, if you couldn't take the testimony of the disciples because they were followers of Jesus, they were close proximity to him, if you couldn't take the testimony and the multiple times that Jesus had appeared to different ones, then certainly a group of 500 people who had seen him and experienced him, that's the testimony you could accept, right? It would hold in court, wouldn't it? 500 individuals that would come up and say, I've seen him, he's alive. 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 I've seen him, his... I'm not going to do it 500 times, by the way. <laughs> Jesus appeared to all 500 witnesses that he's not dead, he's alive. Paul would write on, and in 1 Corinthians 15, 7, it says, For the duration of Christ's life on earth, his biological brothers would struggle with, it, with his identity. But his miracles... His death and his resurrection would impact their faith greatly. His brother James would be the only one of his biological brothers who would have a special visit from Jesus. James would become the leader of the Jerusalem church. When you read about that in the book of Acts, it's not James, one of the disciples, but it's James, the brother of Jesus. He's the one that wrote the book of James. And Jesus' other brother, Jude, is the one that wrote the book of Jude. These men that had grown up with Jesus, that had seen him day in and day out, they knew what he was like behind closed doors and that he was no different behind closed doors than he was in front of everyone else. They knew the compassion. They knew the tenderness. They knew the sternness. They knew the correctness. They knew the holy life. They knew all of those things. But they had struggled all through Jesus' life up until his death. But Paul reminds us that in one moment, James would behold the Lord Jesus in a private moment. And with his own eyes, he would see and begin to testify, he's not dead, he's alive. Jesus would appear to the disciples one more time. 
In Luke chapter 24, verses 44 to 53, 40 days after his resurrection, he would gather there in Jerusalem, and there on a mountain, not very far from, from that area, he would gather them on the mountain. It was very common for him to take them up on the mountain so that they could get a better view, a better perspective. And there, as he was talking to them, he gave them his last commandment and his last commission. His last commandment was this. Don't leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift that I promise, the gift from my Father. For the Holy Spirit will come, and you will receive power. Then, now's the commission, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Jamaria, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the other most parts of the earth. And as he was speaking, the word tells us that he began to rise. And he would ascend to heaven. I wonder if it was something like the, the rising of a hot air balloon. You almost don't notice when it starts. But he just began in the midst of his conversation. And before long, all of a sudden, they saw that he was ascended from them. And they continued to watch as he went on back into heaven, as you and I would have too, right? Let me just be honest. That's a strange sight to see somebody fly. And as they are staring up into the heavens, Jesus knew that if he didn't send an angel, they were going to continue to just stay there on the mountain and stare up into the heavens. And so all of a sudden... An angel appears and says, why are you staring up into the heavens? This same Jesus that you have seen go into heaven will come in like manner. Now go back to Jerusalem and wait for the gift. And as they came down the mountain, and as they would experience the filling of the Holy Spirit there ten days later, they would go then into all the world and they would proclaim the truth that he's not dead, but he's alive. Amen. On another desert road, a few years, a few weeks after that, this experience had taken place, a man named Saul, who would later change his name to Paul, would be riding on a horse. And as they would be riding to the city of Damascus, Paul had within, his, within his, uh, his possession different articles, different uh, uh, a piece of paper that would give permission for him to put people in prison or put them to death because they followed Jesus. And on that road, it says a light from heaven would shine so bright that it blinded him. It knocked him off of his horse. And immediately in that moment, Jesus stood in front of him and said, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? His response was, who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. And now arise and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. In that moment, Paul's or Saul's life was transformed and he would later change his name to Paul to recognize the transition that had happened in him. And he would leave that dusty road and he would begin a missionary journey a few years later in which he would plant church after church throughout all of the Middle East in that day. And he would declare the reality and write 1 Corinthians chapter, uh, chapter 15 in which he would talk about the resurrection of Jesus, that he's not dead, he's alive. And my friends, it was a Sunday just like today. The birds were singing, the, the flowers were budding, everything was blooming. And, and there on an island, not very far from Jerusalem, there on a little island, an old man who had known Jesus for many, many years, 90 years of age. There, John would find himself in prison. And it was Sunday. It says that it was the Lord's Day, and John was in worship. Just like you, and just like me. Would you hear what John saw that day? I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet with a golden sash around his chest. His head, of, his head and hair were white like wool and as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. 
His feet were like bronze, glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun, shining in all of its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. That moment, John would see once more with his very eyes the risen Jesus who was standing in front of him, and John would be able to declare as he would see the, the revelation of what is yet to come that we serve a risen Savior. He is alive today. He's not dead. He's alive. And that story continues on to this very day. As various ones of you have encountered the risen Jesus, you have seen Him in the grace that has been extended to you. You've experienced it in the hands of others that have done something in the name of Jesus. But you've seen Him in the Word of God. And as He has revealed Himself to you, you have said, Behold, I am a sinner. I am dead in my transgressions and sin. And I cannot go any farther. I will surrender myself to His, his care. And I will invite Him into my life. And you too have received the healing grace, the saving grace, of a risen Savior. He's not dead. He's alive. Amen. Folks, this morning, we celebrate with some who have said that. That He's not dead. He's alive. There's a pool that's in front of me that is uh, a baptismal pool. Some of you are saying, why do we have one in the middle of the floor there? I thought we had one back there. That one leaks. It's broken. So far, this one doesn't. I just want you to know that throughout the entire service, I have been holding back from doing a cannonball. Just want you to know. I really have wanted to just, you know. One of those last declarations of, he's not dead, he's alive, splash. That's what I wanted to do. I just, I've got to be honest with you. But we celebrate with a number of people that have said, there was a point in my life when Jesus was dead to me. I didn't know him. I didn't understand who he was. I didn't believe in him. But because of the teachings of God's word and because of the grace that he has extended, I realize that I'm a sinner and I've invited Jesus into my life. And since that moment, I have been completely transformed. And so because I love Jesus, I want to follow Him in obedience and be baptized. You see, baptism is not salvation. Baptism is a public declaration that salvation has already happened in me. And it's declaring that from this point forward, I'm going to take the message, I'm going to take the truth that He's not dead. He's alive. And so as the worship team comes... I invite those who are going to be baptized to go and find their places in the various rooms here. Men are that way, and the ladies are that way. Let's make sure we get that correct. Ladies over there by the drums, men are over behind the piano. Would you stand with me, please? Lord Jesus, we thank you for your truth today, that you are not dead, but you are alive alive forevermore. May that truth ring in our hearts. May we find ourselves there in that resurrection portrait. And may we share the truth to all we encounter. Bless those that are about to follow you in baptism. Bless us as we celebrate along with them. What a glorious, happy day this is. Amen.